We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to live on the run, always chasing, never stop. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. How are you, Ben? I'm doing so good, Patrick. Thanks. We are returning to our two-minute drill. And we're going to take it very seriously today because uh, there's a class about to start here at CrossFit New England, and there's going to be huh. some background music, so we're going to go kind of fast today. Uh, two-minute drill is when uh, folks, uh, listeners, send us really good questions, um, and uh, we we uh, try to get answers in under two minutes. Uh, for folks who want to get into the into the queue, find me on Instagram, P.S. Cummings, and just drop me a DM, and I'll get it onto our list. Okay, without further ado, ready? Ready. First one, how do you distinguish between the principle of never whine, never complain, never make excuses, and allowing space for people to talk about the hard things in their life, for example, a parent in hospice, a marriage on the rocks, et cetera? Yeah, there's um, two additional principles that you have to attach to never whine, never complain, never make excuses. If you do these two things, you are not complaining, making excuses, or whining. You're being productive. Mm -hmm. And that is when you enter the conversation, you do it with a solution-oriented mindset. So if you want to chat about, and this is what we, we talk about this internally at our, at, in our, with our team. If you want to talk about the struggles you're having with a coworker or a manager, it's very different to go... Um, Patrick, I'd love to catch your ear on this. I'm struggling with this employee and I'd love to hear your take on what's going on. Mm -hmm. Let me give me like three minutes to tell you the struggles that I'm having and I, let me know what you're... That's very different than going like, I can't believe Beth is such a... She always comes at me and says, that's just venting. Two very different things. That's complaining and whining. The second is that after I go to you, I then need to go to the person I have the issue with. Mm. So as if you do that, but then you do it with six other people, you're just spinning the rumor mill. So never whine, never complain, never make excuses. It's different saying, um, recognizing something that we need to deal with. It's so hot out here. We're at a track workout. Okay, that... We need to make sure we stay hydrated. We need to make sure we have cooling mechanisms. We need to make sure we're doing the appropriate level of intensities and volumes. That is with a solution. Instead of going like, it's so freaking hot. It's so, that's not solution oriented whatsoever. It's very different than you not going to the coach and going like, it's so hot out here. What are they making us do? Like, I can't believe this. And then go to another person like, can you believe how hot it is here? And they're making us do this. Big differences. Got it. Next question. I recently, law, I recently lost both my parents within a week of each other in January. How do you guys recommend uh, to deal with loss and grief? It's been about five months and it, feels, it still feels like yesterday. That's very, very hard. Um, when you, so here's, here's the suggestion and I am not the person that, <laughs> I'm not the expert on this, but my suggestion is to experience it. Mm -hmm. and experience the grief fully. Don't try to repress it or resist it. Don't try to not feel the grief. Don't try to, um, when it bubbles up, push it back down. Feel it and feel it fully, 100%, and realize it's not sadness. It's love coming up and through you. If you don't let it come up and through you, you're stopping it and creating a blockage, mm -hmm. literally a blockage that all other future feelings, emotions, thoughts will also get stuck. You need to let this whole thing pass through you. And the only way you can do it is by doing it fully. This is why... There are some mechanisms put in place, however hard they are, to start the process, like wakes and funerals and so on. This is why we do this as a society, so that you can allow to hug everyone you know and have this experience of seeing everyone that cared about that person you care about have it, so it doesn't drag out over years and years and years. What we need to do is after that whirlwind of that systemized process happens, continue to allow it to happen. And if you keep pushing it down, it's going to keep bubbling back up. And you keep pushing it down, it's keep bubbling back up. 
And then also recognize there's going to be probably for the rest of your life moments that you cry about this. Yeah. And that's okay. But the reason you're crying about it is because of love, not because of sadness. It's because of love. You don't feel that way for somebody that you didn't care about that has passed. There are millions of people that die every day that you don't feel that way about them. This is what love is. What you're doing is continuing to experience the love. So there's two things. Experience it, but then also maybe start to reframe it from this is so terrible, I'm so sad, to this is an amazing thing. I can still feel their love. Yeah. You are key. This is amazing. They still mean that much to you. That's amazing. Yeah. And just embedded in your answer, I think, is which is worth pointing out is the don't judge yourself for it. Five months is not that long. 12 months is not that long. Say 17 years. Don't judge yourself for, for that. Let it happen. Yeah. Next question. I'm in the predicament of dealing with grandparents who won't respect our wishes when it comes to food for our kids. I understand that kids need grandparents, but I'm also dealing with my spouse who's happy to just limit, disregard, ignore her parents entirely. It's all pretty frustrating. What are some solutions that come to mind when dealing with this while also being respectful of their perspective? Okay, so this is as a big, there's a big difference here between the, the how much time the kids spend with the grandparents. This is this is the big, huge depends. So I'm going to do it the way that most people with their grandparents, they, they see their grandparents at holidays, maybe, you know, every other month. Yep. Is that about right, you think? Yeah, people, that's kids, a, parents, it's certainly with us it is. Every other month. Yep. It's not a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not a big deal. So when they're at their grandparents, you let the grandparents be grandparents. And for the other, if we're doing Pareto's principle, 80-20, if this happens, you're at like 97.3, like <laughs> right. if not more. Well, we can actually do this. If they're there for three days every 60 days, that's like uh, 5%. You're 95.5. Mm-hmm. You're killing it. Let them have let them have their way that they connect with their grandparents instead of trying to fight that battle and all the – let it be. Mm-hmm. Just let it be. Now, the exception to that is do you li- your grandparents live with you? Yeah. Are they watching the kids every day? Are they watching your gotta, kids every day? You got to you gotta have, that's your environment. You have to make sure your environment is safe and healthy. So in that case, you have to have the hard conversation or just like everything else, you have to make some really hard decisions. Mm-hmm. Is this the best thing for them to be a part of your life if it's that unhealthy? At my gym, sometimes we'll do a hard Metcon in which the entire class is likely at their max high heart rate. And the coach gets us directly into the stretching part, laying down on the floor specifically. As soon as time is finished, is there is this something good for the athlete? So I guess the question is like high, mm-hmm. heavy heart rate, straight into stretching, straight into something uh, still. Um, so no, it's not necessarily it's a bad thing for the athletes, but this coach is a, is a novice coach or maybe he's experienced, but he just doesn't understand what the repercussions are that he's doing over time what this will do because stretching is hard mm-hmm. it's way harder than lying on the ground and allowing yourself to recover right for sure like there is exertion with stretching that's why yoga is difficult and people say like, relax mm-hmm. like you just need to relax in this position breathe because it's challenging yep. otherwise you're just sitting yep. right if there's if you're at an end range you're trying to make changes you're stretching you're doing that so <laughs> i've even definitely foam had stretching so- sessions that where it's just sitting on the floor yeah but so even <laughs> foam rolling you're supporting yourself yeah. it's something yep. So what this coach is doing over time is building in this expectation that the moment you finish, you are not finished. There's more to do. And what will happen is over time, the athletes Mm. will not give their maximal effort. They're going to save something because they're going to know that they either that or they will give their, and now the coach has lost control a little bit because some people are stretching, some people aren't. Now there's these inconsistencies. It's the, the question is not necessarily, is this good or bad for the athletes is should the coach do this? Mm-hmm. And the answer is no. Mm-hmm. The coach should give the, the the buffer time to allow the athletes to recover. Minimum, minimum two minutes, better three to five. Mm-hmm. Got it. I normally get a one hour class workout at my box and I would like to work on my strength, but time, uh, time in the gym is limited. I would have time at home, but I don't know how to work on strength. Is there a way that I can work on that at home? Would you recommend certain exercises with limited equipment? Yeah. So, uh, the limited equipment, if I would, I would start there, I would get a barbell. Talked about that recently about the barbell being the best training tool in the world. And then with limited time, I would work up to a heavy rep five. 
this is super simple. Like I'm going to answer this really simple. Heavy rep of five of back squat, dead, and press. You don't need a bench. You don't need... Uh, you could use a, a rack. If you don't have a rack, then you could do, switch out the back squat for front squat. You clean off the ground. But you can build up to a heavy five of each of those each day. Choose the movement that most um, closely replicates the most dominant movement pattern in your conditioning piece. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing a workout that has lots of air squats in it, that day you're going to do squats. If you're choosing yeah. a workout that has lots of push-ups in it, you're going to do press. If you're choosing a workout that has lots of cleans in it, you're going to do deadlift. And each day with limited time, just work quickly work up to a heavy set of five, limited equipment, just get a barbell. Love that. Next question. I work in a public school. We have, uh, we have a $25,000 uh, grant money to start an after school activity to promote non-competitive play for grades five through eight. What ideas do you have for kids to engage in play uh, aside from the standard recess games? And again, aside from the, the competitive play. Oh man. So if, if this was me and so this person, if they listen to the podcast, is probably closer to me than they are just like a regular gym teacher. I would buy um, a whole bunch of they 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 create um five pound kid barbells. Mm. They're super. Every kid can pick up a five pound dumbbell is heavy because you have to lift it in one hand. Five pound barbell not, but it's a barbell, not a dowel. It's enough to give feedback. Yep. So the front rack, the bar can actually sit there. There's actually something to the bar path in the press. And what I would do is just very slowly, I would get the kids in organized lines, very slowly teach them the fundamental movements of here's a hang power clean, mm -hmm. pause in the, the, um, the power position, pause in the catch, just drill it in, drill it in, drill it in like a Simon Says type of style, I would have them do the same thing with a front squat and with a press. It's almost like the same. Yeah. It's almost, <laughs> right? Fundamentals, yeah. right? Yep. And I would do that and I would drill that into them for about five, five, 10, depending on the attention span, 15 minutes every day on rinse, wash, repeat. So they're seeing it at least once a week, if not two or three times a week, each movement. And then I would do essentially AMRAPs without any equipment. I would do burpee, run, you know, um, jump over an object, um, and, um, you know, um, that type of stuff, like non scored, just get movement, mm -hmm. like just move, 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 but not necessarily with a ball, like movements. Yep. So first part, just get coach B in your, in your school. <laughs> uh, okay. Next question. What do you guys make of the seemingly low standard of movement quality currently seen at the highest level of, uh, the cross of CrossFit competition? When we see top level athletes getting away with failing to meet movement standards, like locking up deadlifts and muscle ups when riding the line of speed over quality, what message does that send to the average Joe CrossFitter as a coach of elite athletes? Would one have to tell their athletes to blur that line as much as possible in order to stay in the game since doing all the reps properly would probably mean going too slow. So a couple little questions in there. Yeah. Uh, um, two minute drill. So summarize you, you take your, what's you summarize the question. Uh, what, are, what, what, what are, should I really, I think the question is, is, is I mean, that, that blurring between going too fast and be, and moving perfectly. Like there's a version of that in the gym and a version of that in the, in the sport. And how do you, yeah. how do you square both of those? Um, we're not looking. So to go and compete at your fastest, we're not looking for perfect form. Now, it sounds weird, but this even in terms of like running mechanics at top end threshold, there's not perfect running mechanics. There's some deviation as it falls apart, as fatigue sets in and people start to fall into just kind of like there's, uh, movement economy, and then there's VO2. There's all these different things that play into performance. At the highest level, perfect technique would be so slow. Yeah, it, it, you'd have if we we're shooting guns, everything would be right on the bullseye exactly. Well, to get the bullseye exactly, you'd have to take so much time between every rep to get everything exactly the way you want it. But this is for time, yep. so we need to go fast as well. The idea is the games are not a teaching thing. They're a competition. Mm -hmm. That'd be like saying like, you know, I watch MMA and they're not doing perfect Kimuras. They're not doing perfect, you know, arm bars. Why are they, why is this person doing a guard, but their ankles aren't crossed the right way? It's because they're in a competitive, they're <laughs> right. in a competitive setting. 
it's not perfect technique. It's the best technique that would produce the most desirable result. And you have to blur the line between technique and intensity. It's just, it's a necessity of speed. Yeah, it's like Formula One and driving school. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like you wouldn't right. confuse the two. Yeah, yeah. Like, why did yeah. that person not take a perfect line? It's because they're going 200 no miles blinker. an hour. <laughs> All right, next question. How do you come back from a bad or demoralizing workout? The, this is going to sound like I'm being coy, but I'm not. There is no such thing. Mm. Show me the bad or demoralizing workout, and I'll show you judging things that you shouldn't be judging. Mm hmm. Is a bad remote because you didn't meet your expectations? Well, eliminate your expectations. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, I'm not like just throwing that out there. Like, why are you setting up your, because I wanted to beat that guy because I didn't beat my previous score because um, five, like, like, eliminate all that. If you want to find your peak performance, eliminate the distractions. The distractions are your expectations and your judgments. There is no such thing as good or bad. Like, just, I know that sounds like too esoteric of an answer. Sit with that for a little bit. There is no such thing as good or bad. There is no such thing as a demoralizing workout. There is no such thing as a bad workout. Sit with that. I'm the head coach of our national ladies cricket team, and I've come up with a selection criteria for the team. I'd love to get your and ben opi Ben's opinion on it in order of report importance, attitude, form, result, form and results, and potential. So that's the kind of the going down the so line. So she says like attitude is the first attitude thing that she is looks first, for. And then results and then potential. Results being like the, 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 their ability, I yeah. guess I'd say. Like or, what, yeah, can they, yeah. what can they do? Or uh, I took that as like what they could do with coaching opportunities, et cetera. So would that be potential? That's the last, oh, sorry. So yeah, so attitude, yeah. results. So what they've already done probably. Yeah, uh, how good are they now? The third one, exactly. Okay, so she want to get both of ours take. What's your take? Oh, goodness. I don't know, I'll let you go first. And if I've I think it that. sounds awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that was my that's, problem too. That's, 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 that's what I would do. Yeah. That's, that's almost literally the way that I would vet my athletes. Now, the other thing that I put in there is sort of, uh, which goes into results, I guess, is kind of just like, or potential, it goes in there somewhere, but it's like the the biomechanics type mm -hmm. thing. Like, are they the right fit mm -hmm. and size? Yeah. Yep. Like, for what I need, can, yeah, are, you right. the, are you set are up you, for success? Are you there? 66 years old? Yeah, right. Because <laughs> if you are, like, maybe, that, and that's probably embedded in potential, right? Yep. So, right. I think yeah. it's a great list. Thinking about CrossFit is like, okay, yeah. are you the right, relatively right height, yeah, weight, exactly. size, age yep. of somebody So all of that yeah. seems, yep. I, I think it's a great list. Oh, cool. Uh, two more. What is your opinion on gyms that have personalized cubbies? That is cubbies with names on them. On one hand, it's a perk for members, but on the other hand, uh, for new people who come in and have no place to put their gear, um, how do we reach our community with fitness and health if our gym is a private club for just members? Yeah. Um, you just have to be transparent of how people get their names on the cubbies. If you're transparent about how you get your name on there, that's awesome. If it's just like, who does someone like or um, because people have started putting their stuff there and now there's a name on it, that's that's really weird. Mm -hmm. That's a bad model because what this person is saying is exactly right. Like I'm always going to feel like I'm on the outside until I reach the cool kid status and I don't know how to get cool. Right. Kids and status. if there's only 12 cubbies and like, right. Yeah. There's preferential treatment. If it's people that are lifetime members and people are lifetime members that they're lifetime members because they were the first to sign up and they're the ones that got the thing and this is their reward for having it. Awesome. Is it people pay an extra $50 a month to have a cubby. Awesome. Yep. But it's just a matter of clarity around the tran and transparency around how did someone get their name on there? Yeah. If you have that, there's not a right or wrong. Right. I think it's such a cool opportunity to make it part of the process of starting is you get a cubby after you've hit 12 workouts, whatever, whatever you deem as like a valuable marker to celebrate. I love that. But the challenge is going to be what happens when 600 athletes have hit 12 workouts. Right. Cause it's, I'm assuming that at some point, like you've got empty, like there's, yeah. so there's if logistics. You, let's say you had like your 20 cubbies. Yep. Right. Maybe, the question is like, is there only 20 or do you have enough cubbies for everybody, which is a different. I'm thinking different. about like most gyms. Yep. There's a space for like 20 to 40 right. cubbies, maybe like yeah, that. That's so maybe it's like, if you've been a member at the, t at the sure. five year mark yeah. at the, and you can move that, whatever it is, but yep. exactly whatever, how you, ever you want to do it, it costs a thousand dollars. One time fee, you get a mm -hmm. cubby. You, um, anyone and that, you're not buying the cubby, you're, you're what you're exactly. It's not like anybody, <laughs> or it could be, it, it could be any, it could be, yeah. 
um, anyone that's deadlifted 500 pounds. It doesn't matter what it is. Just you said make it clear. clear. Yeah. All of that. Okay, last question we've got. We're crushing it today. Uh, how do you feel about gym owners that promote a monthly price but are willing to make deals with new members and offer them a lower price if they feel like they'd be a valuable member, a, a valuable addition to the community? So everyone at the gym is really playing it, paying a different price regardless of what's being advertised. I don't like it, but again, kind of similar to the last answer, unless you're being really transparent. Yeah. Like what we say is we do, we just want to be clear and clear is kind no discounts for friends, family, or for financial reasons. Yep. So we just lay that precedent out. Yep. It's like, it's on our policies sheet. But if you want to do it the other way, like um, I've seen it work equally as well in other ways. It's really cool. It's like, we charge $150 a month. If you're having financial difficulties, let us know and we'll work with you because we want you here. Yep. If you're that clear about that and you post it for everybody to know, why would anybody complain about that? You just have a conversation with somebody saying like, I'm having financial, if you're not, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. So it's again, it's one of those like clear is kind. It's when you're not clear that people start to second guess Questions motives. like that. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Love it. All right, my friend. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody out there for listening. If you do want to get a question into the queue, find me on Instagram, PS Cummings, drop me a DM and I will add it to our list. Thank you for your uh, ratings and your reviews. Ben and I will be back next week for another episode of Chasing Excellence. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.